Hey guys and welcome back to yet another Lost Bits video right here on Tetra Bay Gaming, the series where we explore some noteworthy scrapped, unused, and unseen content in video games. In this video, we're going to take it way back to the game that just about every NES owner had, the game people go as far as saying saved the video game industry in 85, and the game pretty much every gamer has to play at least once in their lives, Super Mario Bros. for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And as always, really quickly before we begin, if at any point you guys do enjoy this video, be sure to slap a like down below, it seriously helps me out a lot. And also, comment what other Lost Bits videos you'd like to see next. And with all that said, let's jump right back to saving Princess Peach for the first time, and find some Lost Bits. Before we jump into the unused, I thought it would be cool to talk about the entire scrapped concept that was initially planned for Super Mario Bros. So after upgrading the game from a 16x32 pixel rectangle to using Mario, the game was initially meant to play more like a side-scrolling shooter, rather than a platformer. Apparently Mario was planned to carry various weapons, including a rifle and a beam gun. The game was going to have both ground and sky levels in which Mario would ride on a rocket or Nimbus-like cloud, as seen in this early development sketch. The controls were meant to be pretty similar to the final release of Super Mario Bros, save for having up on the D-pad being used to jump, and A used to attack, presumably using whatever weapon Mario was holding. Also, it looks like Yoshi was initially supposed to appear in Super Mario Bros 2, possibly either as a vehicle type for Mario to ride, much like the rocket in the sky segments, or to have a more similar role to that seen in Super Mario World. Likely due to technical limitations, it was decided to completely not include Yoshi in the game. It's pretty crazy how different the final product turned out to be from this early concept, and who knows if the game would have been nearly as popular had it not changed. Alright, let's jump right back to some music that goes unused in the game. First off, there's an alternate theme that was going to be used for the game over music. I'll play the original first, and then the unused one right after. As you heard, the unused one was pretty similar, although it sounds a little bit different and more plinky. The second unused sound clip is an alternate version of the Hurry Up theme, which would play between levels where Mario transitions from overworld to underworld, or water levels, through a warp pipe. At first you might think this is the exact same Hurry Up theme that does go used in the game, but it differs in that the final version skips the first seven notes of the overworld theme. I'm guessing it was meant to be used if you beat a level with a timer under 100. It was probably changed because either the developers thought the sense of urgency wasn't necessary after beating a level, or my other theory is that maybe at one point in development the timer allotted time to beat the whole world instead of a per level basis. Next up is a single unused object left over in the game's files. Although it looks like just a brown version of the top of the end flagpole, it is apparently stored in the game as a unique object. When placed in the game, Mario can apparently climb up and down a stack of them, just like he would with a vine, and will make a weird buzzing sound as he does. Next up are some time limit settings that go unused in the game. The first of these being the timer starting at 200, which was probably deemed to be too short for any of the levels in the final game. The other setting sets the timer at 0. This setting actually is used during the pipe transition between overworld and underground or water levels, but the timer is disabled, rendering this setting pointless. For obvious reasons though, no level in the game actually starts you off with 0 seconds on the clock. There is also an unused counter in the game which keeps track of how many blocks you hit. Nothing in the game ever calls for this number, so my theory is that it was a really early method of using the number of blocks hit in order to calculate a score. Or maybe it would have led to a bonus at the end of a level if a player broke more than X amount of blocks. Again, going back to the transition cutscene between levels, they all feature these L-shaped pipes, which are only seen during these transitions. Although Mario is only seen entering them from the side entrance, at one point for one reason or another, Mario could enter the top as well, as the mechanic is still present in the game's code. Moving along, there is an unused Lakitu behavior that was altered in the final version of the game. Well, I shouldn't really say altered, because the way Lakitu throws the spiny eggs that we all know and love is actually the result of a bug. As you can see, the spiny eggs were intended to be thrown at a velocity relative to the player, and the eggs would have bounced off any tiles as well. This is quite different compared to what we all saw in the final game, in which the spiny eggs are thrown with no horizontal movement. Now I honestly think the original intended way makes the Lakitu levels much more difficult because it adds an extra layer of uncertainty in where the spinies will be thrown. 
The biggest reason I've never been a fan of underwater levels in Super Mario Bros has always been the bloopers. Their unpredictability has caused me way more deaths than they probably should have. These bloopers were also apparently supposed to at one point make an appearance above ground as well, but thankfully they were scrapped. They can actually be seen above ground in the glitch level in the Japanese Famicom version of the game, World Minus 3. Unlike the underwater bloopers in the game, the above ground ones can be stomped on and will net the player a thousand points. These same above ground bloopers appear in the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, which was initially deemed too difficult for a western audience, in which they act the same way and also award a thousand points. This only reinforces the idea that they would have had a bigger role in the first game, but they were probably removed for difficulty reasons. So if you've played Super Mario Bros. before, chances are that at one point or another you stumbled upon a warp pipe that led you to a bonus room with some extra coins. Well, did you know that all of the variations of these bonus rooms are actually connected together and are found in the same area? Thanks to Neko Run or Deep Game Research, by removing the barrier at the edge of the screen, we can jump behind the pipes that would normally lead you back to the main level. And if we keep going, we can see that every variant that you will ever see in the game is here, in the same room. One thing that I was curious about was what would happen if Mario goes up the pipe in one of the other rooms that he isn't supposed to be in. And it turns out when taking any other pipe, for some reason, you get taken to World 1-2, where you would normally emerge after the level's bonus room. The weird thing is that the game still thinks you are playing on the first level. So after you beat this underground stage, the game still thinks you only beat the first level, so you have to go back and beat it again. I tried this again in other worlds, and similarly, the game will also just take you to the next level, but again, it doesn't count the previous level as being completed. When I was younger, I spent several hours trying my absolute best to try and jump over the flagpoles at the end of the levels to no avail. I thought that it must have been impossible, until I saw that you actually can jump over them in certain instances. Although not jumping over the flag, by using some cheats we can actually just walk through it with much less effort. Now normally, if you keep running past the flag, you will pass the castle and it appears that the background tiles just keep looping forever until the timer runs out. Thankfully, by using some more cheats, you can disable the time limit and Mario can run much further than he was intended to. After a while, the normality of the level goes away and suddenly, seemingly random tiles will start to appear. They obviously look out of place and bizarre to say the least. It honestly reminds me of some pretty bad Super Mario Maker levels that I've seen. Another cool thing to note is that if you get by the flagpoles before the castle stages, you can see that the castle walls seen in World 8 are used to give the castle some more depth, even off screen. And lastly for this video, another crazy thing that I found when researching was several unused glitch levels. These levels can be accessed in Super Mario Bros with the use of a level modifier code to select the world after World 8, which is referenced apparently as 256W. For example, this is apparently known as World 137-1, Glitch Level 4B, or simply Sky Corridor. It's a somewhat playable level with some seemingly random tile placements. I don't really know the purpose of these glitch levels or how they even exist, but they are definitely pretty intriguing. There are way too many of them to cover in this video, but if you'd like to see more of them, YouTuber Deco the Dragon covers a lot of them over at his channel. For example, there's another level numbered as World T-1, 29-1, or Glitch Level 50. And this is a long segment with some more random tiles, enemies, solid clouds, and cheap cheeps that turn into red Koopas. For whatever reason. But with that concludes this Lost Bits on the original Super Mario Bros for the NES, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it was a little bit shorter, and originally I thought to stay away from shorter Lost Bits like this, but please let me know if you'd be interested in seeing more mini Lost Bits in the future, as it would open a door for many new games to be possible for future episodes. And another special thanks to Neko Run for working his magic to make parts of this episode possible. I definitely recommend checking him out if you want to see some more hacks for a variety of different games. And if you're new to the channel and enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe and click on the card right here for some more awesome Lost Bits. And if you would like to stay even more up to date with me and the channel, consider following me on other social media sites which will all be linked in the description below. And as always guys, thank you all so much for watching today and for all of your amazing support, and for helping me reach almost 50,000 subscribers, and I will see you in a bit.